let's be honest, we're all glad 2020 is over. 2021 looks like it'll be quite an interesting year for DCS World. And if I'm reading the community right, what people are most looking forward to can be summed up in three words. Clouds, clouds, and clouds. But that's not all the developers of DCS have in store for us. So let's take a dive into Ego Dynamics' roadmap for 2021. In addition to all of the changes that they're going to be adding to DCS this year, ED also announced the following modules that they plan on releasing. The de Havilland Mosquito, the MI-24, and the Apache Attack Helicopter. Additionally, I also know that Polychop Simulations is also really close on releasing their OH-58 Kiowa Warrior. So what do all these aircraft have in common? I mean, besides the spinning rotors. All of them have multiple crew members. This is a big step forward from a programming point of view. And what I mean by that is there's several tasks that you have to take care of behind the scenes if you want multiple people to control the same aircraft within the sim. First off, you need to coordinate animations across the network. When they're not coordinated, you see things like one crew member lowering the gear and flaps, but when the other one looks out the window, he sees the plane in a clean configuration. Then when they land, the second player sees the plane hovering a few feet off the ground because the gear animation never played on his screen. Same thing with the switches inside the cockpit. The other major concern is crew entry and exit. What do you do when a pilot quits or is disconnected? Can someone join the crew without permission? How do you handle swapping seats? How are the individual clients handled when the aircraft crashes? These questions all need to be answered and a coding solution put into place before multi-crew can work in a game like DCS. And it looks like all those problems have finally been solved. And while I haven't seen a formal announcement from ED, I think they've put together an API for multi-crew, which is why they're able to put out so many multi-crew aircraft in a single year. Now I know not everyone knows what an API is or why it's important, so let's go over that. API stands for Application Programming Interface. And in the context used in DCS, it's just a fancy way of saying a group of programming tools bundled together for your convenience as a developer. It's just like going to a hardware store and buying a collection of tools. If you didn't have pre-made tools, you would have to make the tools every time you wanted to do a project, and that would cut down on a number of projects you could work on. Same thing applies in software development. With an API, someone has gone through the process of making the tools so that you can spend more time making your project better. In DCS, one high-profile example of an API is the air-to-ground radar API. Before this was introduced, a developer would have to code that air-to-ground radar from scratch. And that's exactly what Heatblur did with the Viggins radar. If we followed that model, then every time a dev wanted to include an air-to-ground radar in their module, they would have to make one from scratch. And that's a lot of redundant work. But when you package it all up into an API, you're acting as a force multiplier. Every time someone uses that API, you just save that developer a ton of time they could use to add other features. And that's exactly what ED did with the air-to-ground radar API. Its first use was in the JF-17. Now it's being implemented in the Hornet and Viper. And every time it's used in the future, it will save developers even more time. That brings us to one of the big announcements in this year's roadmap, ED's new FLIR API. Not only is it great because it will help out every dev team with the FLIR equipped aircraft, but it will also give ED an opportunity to make FLIR more realistic at the same time. To show you what I mean, let's take a look at how FLIR is currently rendered in DCS. Right now, you get a fairly even highlight of thermal energy on a ground vehicle making it stick out from the terrain. Now let's check out some real-life FLIR imagery to compare. It's pretty obvious that in real life only the hot parts of a vehicle will be hot. And that's usually the parts near the engine, exhaust vents, treader wheels that heat up with friction, and the gun barrels. In real life, these can also cool off if the vehicle has been inactive for a while. Parts can also heat up from intense sunlight. I'm looking forward to seeing ED's new rendition of FLIR and how it compares to real life imagery. I imagine for most people, the visual appeal of the new clouds is what they're most interested in. And without a doubt, they do look amazing. But I caught a few things in ED's statement that got me thinking. The new clouds will block visual and optical sensor line of sight and be synchronized online. 
This is important for a few reasons. For those that don't already know, the older clouds weren't synchronized across computers. So if you were flying in formation with a friend and went into a cloud, you would lose sight of your friend. But when you told him you were blind and stuck in a cloud, he wouldn't know what you're talking about because from his point of view, you were in clear skies and he saw you right off his wing. The old clouds are generated locally and have no interaction with any other systems. But in real life, clouds can inhibit radar, radio waves, and of course optics. You can get radar returns from a cloud or lose a radar contact that's on the far side of a thunderstorm. Radio transmissions might get filled with static or cut off altogether if the weather is bad enough. But if the systems that model all this in DCS aren't tied into the weather, then you won't see any of it represented in the game. And that's why I think the ED team required a few years to get these clouds into the game. The new cloud framework had to be more than just scenery that was generated on your PC. It had to be shared with the network system, and the AI system, and the FLIR system, and all the other systems that make up DCS. ED had to get all the teams to update their little slice of DCS to make their code compatible with the new weather. That's where the extra time came in, but I think we can all agree the results look great. One of the things I know a lot of people are excited about is the Vulkan API and its implications for multi-threading. Before we dive into what this new API and multi-threading can do to enhance our DCS performance, we need to understand what we're talking about first. When software runs on our PC, it is organized into a process, and everything inside it shares some computer resources to get a job done. Within that process, your workflow will be organized into a set of steps known as a thread. This thread acts just like an assembly line. In our case, that assembly line takes raw data and builds it into a picture that is rendered on your screen as a frame. Faster assembly lines give us more frames per second. But there is a limit to our assembly line, and that limit is that a thread can only be worked by a single core of a processor. So a one-thread process in an eight-core processor will see only one core working while the other seven sit idle. Does this mean multi-threading in an eight-core CPU will make DCS run eight times as fast? Unfortunately, the answer is not that easy for a couple reasons. First off, not every thread is going to be the same. Some will be more complex than others. You can end up in a situation where one pipeline takes a lot longer to finish its thread and the others have to stop while it catches up. The developers need to be smart in how they break up the main thread into multiple smaller threads to keep this from happening. And if they're not careful with how they manage their threads, they run the risk of the threads stepping all over each other. I did some testing using Windows Resource Monitor to see how my CPU was handling DCS in its current state. Let's dive into the results and see where we can get some performance gains. This column represents my CPU's activity when I do not have DCS open, and we'll be using that as a baseline. This column shows my CPU's activity while I was flying solo and offline. DCS is running 53 concurrent threads and we can see them distributed pretty evenly outside of the top and bottom pipelines. We can see the activity pick up here when I hopped onto a multiplayer server with 17 clients connected. Overall CPU activity is up with 55 total threads running, but still pretty evenly spread outside of the bottom pipeline. When I joined a multiplayer server hosting 33 clients, I saw something different happen. We went up to 61 total threads running, but there was a big concentration of activity on the bottom pipeline. All the others showed an unexpected decrease in activity. This makes me think that the bottom pipeline is saturated and the other pipelines are sitting idle waiting for it to process its share of threads. This is where some optimization can be done. Right now that one pipeline is going over 90%, which means there isn't much room to grow. But if this workload was evenly distributed across all the pipelines, my CPU would only be 30% utilized. That would leave room for gains in the neighborhood of triple the performance I see right now. That's significant, and I think that's what ED is aiming for with this multi-threading update. Overall, it looks like 2021 is going to be a great year for DCS. There were some more things in the roadmap that I wanted to comment on, but I'd like to wait until the ED releases more details before I go into them. Until then, let's enjoy the clouds. Thanks for watching.